it's time for the big conversations telling stories of movers and shakers of industry giants and daring professionals it's time for the conversations that change your perspective on life the kind of conversations that shape entrepreneurs and move careers forward if you don't know where these conversations are found we are sending you a gps but if you're listening to this voice All right, welcome to the Growth Podcast. This week on the podcast, we are having um, Engineer Abel Ngandu. Uh, we have been trying to get him for the longest time. Finally, he has come and it's understood why he it took this long. Uh, he's quite a busy man and I know that you're going to understand and appreciate that as our conversation continues. Um, Engineer Ngandu, welcome to the podcast. No, thank you, Sewi. Thank you very much. I always appreciate when I, when yes. I speak to you. It's good to see you looking chilled like this. No, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Uh, before we start, I've got these cards. We always play this game with our guests. I've got okay. these cards. Uh, pick any four. Uh, pick any four. Pick any four of those cards. Okay. Yeah. So each of them has a question. Uh, turn the card, ask the question, and answer it. In what ways are you like your parents? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm 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 very kind. That's that's something I'm very. I took. Uh, I can I I can know that I took it from my mom. You know, my mother was tall. Between my mom and dad, my mom my mom was taller. And me again, I'm taller. Okay? Again, people tell me that I'm very kind. And I got that from my my mom again. My mom again, uh, my mom had um, what we call gray hair. Yes. And I've seen, that's where, I'm, even right now, I just dye it a bit. Okay. Yes, otherwise my hair is white. Oh. Yes. Interesting. Next card. Describe your relationship with your father in one sentence. It was great. We had a very, uh, my father is late, but my relationship with my father, he was, first of all, he's the one who inspired me to do business. He was a businessman himself, and um, I learned a lot of things from, from him. So we were very close, and they really wanted me to, to go to school and get educated. Okay. Number three. If you could time travel back to an early time in your life, where would you visit and what would you do? I don't think I would, I would, visit, I would visit the same places. Because when I look back, I think the same places that I've been through are what has made me who I am. So I think I would visit the same, I wouldn't go anywhere else. <laughs> okay, finally. Um, what would you like to re-experience because you did not appreciate it fully the first time? Okay, I would say I wish I'd started my business, my business much earlier, but fate is like that. And it worked out just fine. It worked out, yeah, it worked out. Thank you, Engineer Ngandu. Let's, let's go way back to where you, you come from. You grew up in Chawama. How was that like? Yeah, you know, it was good. First of all, uh, I was born in Chilirawombo. Then from Chilirawombo, we just stayed for about, I think I was five years old. Then my parents moved to Lusaka. So... I I grew up in Kuku, Kuku, Kuku compound in in Chawama. From Kuku compound, I grew. I went to Ch we we moved to Chawama to John Howard. John Howard. That's where we stayed. Maybe about maybe fifteen sixteen years. Then we moved back to uh, what do you call that? We came to Kwamboka where my father built a house. And there, you know, we used to interact. It was a typical Chawama. In a way, we we used to play football. In this, you know, in the in the fields without any grass, without any artificial turf, barefooted, you know, even the balls that we used to to play, it was that, you know, the one Jim which Pombo. was made. yeah, Chimpombo. <laughs> so I went through all that, and I went at Chawama Primary School, uh, just like anybody else. Then from there, I went to Livala Secondary School, and we used to walk. You know, people, when you go back in the eighties, you find that. All this, what we call Kamwala South, it was all bush. Can you imagine Kamwala South and all that? The only place you could see 
when you move from Chawama as you come towards Rivala, the first place you see is Rivala Secondary School. You know, because uh, Rivala Secondary School, and there were certain houses which were just like a strip. There were, I think there were council houses and all that. The rest were just bush. So in our, in our time there, we used to move in groups of maybe 30, and we used to carry rocks as we, as we go to school. Because during that time, there used to be these people used to, they used to say, well, come check it. you know, the people would strangle you. They used to kill people. So when you are going alone, you can end up uh, disappearing. So we used to move maybe 30. And this one has got maybe a stick, this one, whatever thing with our, with our, our books. Then once we reach, we split. Others would go to Kamola Secondary School, others would go to Rivala Secondary School. Then again, when we're coming back, we regroup. There was a point we used to regroup. So we regroup there until we are 30 or 40. And there used to be different groups. And then we'd walk back. And when we are walking back, I can tell you, the group was so formidable that if you, if you see even suspected thieves, maybe at a distance, they would just run away. Because they would say, oh, these boys are very bad. <laughs> so that's, that's how my love was. Okay, what, what, what would you say people don't really know about you? You know, okay, um, okay, I think, well, first of all, when people look at me right now, because maybe I live well, I drive cars and I have nice cars and all that, I think what people don't know is that I've gone through life where sometimes we used to eat rape, would eat rape without cooking oil. You know, they would, you, they would just boil it and do it's brownish, then they add salt, then you... You have sheep on the side. Then my mom will just maybe fly one egg. And that's the egg that you can, you know, just to give it a taste. And it will be maybe five, six children, and you're eating. And once you eat, you go back to bed. There was a time, I mean, there was a time maybe you have one meal a day. Maybe the whole day, but the meal, you will have it. I mean, this was the beginning. The meal you have it maybe towards 16 hours somewhere there, so that when you eat, it covers both lunch. And, you know, so I've been through that. So when people, and that's why um, I really appreciate what I've become. You know, I mean, the blessing that God has given me through hard work. Of course, God, been, God has opened up doors, but I can tell you the blessing. I don't take it for granted because I know where I'm coming from, and that's why one of my key motivators in life is. What motivates me is never to go back to the Chawama days. I mean, to, to the way I live that life. I don't want my children to go to... I'm, I'm very proud my, my children go to the best schools now. They don't go... They, they don't suffer the way I suffered. But I can tell you is that I think my suffering in my childhood made me to who I am. Okay. And the time you are going through all of that, eating rape without cooking oil, you know, eating meals between lunch and, and, and supper, did you dream that, you know, it, it would get better or you were one of those who just feel like those things, the nicer things are not for people like us? No, no, no. In fact, one of the things I can tell you, I used to, even my friends, they talk about, even my mom used to tell me, my sisters, even the mission now, I hated that life. I used to tell my mom continuously, I said, no, we'll sort out this, we'll get out of this. We can't go on like this. I said, look, I'll show you, mom. One day when I'm given the opportunity, I'll work very hard, we'll move, we'll not live in Chawama anymore. And that's why I can tell you, fast forward, I'm very proud, even before my parents died, I built them four houses in Silverest. You know, I built, there was one house and the other three houses for rent. You know, because that was the dream that I had, Envisage for my parents. I told them, I said, I'll take you out of Chawama. I'll take you to a better place. And I'm proud that even before they died, they lived in that place, in Silverest. Okay. And those houses now, they're just on renters. On okay. rent. So if you came from such a very humble background, tell me, how did you manage to sponsor your education? Yeah, uh, first of all, unfortunately, during our time, there was free education. Uh, so from grade one up to grade seven, free education. I went to Chawama Primary School. Then from uh, grade 8 to grade 12, I went to Rivala Secondary School. Again, it was free education. But when I went to University of Zambia, by the way, I passed to go to University of Zambia. When I went to University of Zambia in the School of Natural Sciences, I was there for about a year. 
Now, during that particular year that I was there, I think that was 19, 1992, that's when the government introduced uh, cost sharing, where they said 25% will be paid by the student, then 75% will be covered by the government. Now, during that time, my father, even if he was a businessman, he was going through a very bad patch at that time. We, we had a lot of problems. So my father told me, look, we are just scared. We're worried for you. You have gone to University of Zambia. We'll be able to afford for you in the next three years. But your course is five years. The last two years, we don't know what will happen. So it's better, I think, you start looking for a scholarship if you can. Because even if you are brilliant, you might not... Uh, we, we are scared that this cost sharing is going to cause, cause a lot of problems. That's when I started looking for a scholarship. Fortunately, and you know, I used to walk every day. You no, know, every once a week, I used to walk to Bazaris Committee. Okay, so I'd walk from University of Zambia. Baz I go to Bazaris Committee the day when I was free, like we are, we don't have lectures and all that. I would go there and go and find out whether there are any any opportunities for the scholarship. And this scholarship was not to study in Zambia, to, to study outside. I, I didn't care whether I would have gone to Russia, India, wherever, whichever country. But fortunately, when I was looking for it, they told me, look, um, there is a scholarship, but that scholarship cannot be given to you. People have to write a test. You have to write the entrance test. It's a scholarship to go and study in India. So what they did was, they actually opened up to other students to write that, that exam. So my colleagues from University of Zambia, they wrote with me at Basel. I had to go and tell them, so there's this opportunity. Let's go and sit. So you can imagine I was so determined that I think we were about 80 people who, who sat and they were the only one who picked. You can imagine I was pushing for the same opportunity. They tell me, no, we can't give it to you. Go and tell other people to come and write. So there was a very high risk for me to lose out and so let somebody else go. But you know, I was very hardworking. I said, no, I'm not going to lose this opportunity. And that's how, when I was given the chance, I wrote the test, I got. It. And that's how I left for India. I left for India in January 1993. Okay, so you didn't complete at Unza? No. You went to finish from. Yes, at, at Unza, I only did first year. Oh, only first year? Yes. Ah, so you didn't even go the three years your father was no, talking about. No, no. <laughs> I only did first year, then I I was given a scholarship to go to India. Okay, so fast forward, you you, you graduate India, you come back. Tell me about um, your interaction, how you met um, UWP Consulting, because those then oh, yes. set the tone for what your life has become. Exactly. Country. First of all, okay, when I went to India, I want to tell you this. It was very interesting. You know, it was in the, in the 90s. There were very few blacks in, in India. In fact, at my university, the time I arrived there, I was the only black person. In fact, I was the only black person in the city, in the entire Rorki. You know, you can imagine where they, you go to the... First of all, you don't know the language. They, they speak Hindi. Then I would go to the market. I don't know how to order sugar. I had to learn. I had to go with a small book. You know, sugar was uh, chini. Salt was namak, you know, that kind of stuff. I still remember that. And um, so, but it was... A lot of challenges, but I, I, I had to learn H Hindi. Though the school was, uh, my school was, uh, was teaching English. So, but anyway, with those challenges, I got acclimatized, I got used. And to cut the story short, I got distinction. I graduated with distinction in civil engineering. And I came to Zambia. I worked for a beach, I worked for, I didn't just meet UWP. I worked for a company called BC, Beachhod, BCHOD. So that beach road was a consulting firm. I worked there for about maybe two and a half years to three years. Then that's when I resigned. When I resigned, actually I resigned to go and stay at home because I was supposed to go for a scholarship. And um, by the way, I sat for, I was interviewed for a common scholarship and I got, and I was supposed to go to Canada, McGill University, to go and do my master's. That was in 2000, 2002. Okay, then in 2002 itself, while I was waiting for the scholarship, there was a, a, a conference at the Mulungush International Conference Center, which was Road SIP, 
roadship roadship one it is road sector investment program so i went there to attend just because i didn't have any job so i went there to attend to see what opportunities are there and i think on the second day there was now a presentation where they were talking about opportunities for the locals so the minister said look we don't have a lot of local people now we just have foreign companies who are working why don't you foreign companies why don't you do a joint venture with local people then one i think in that discussion they were saying look but these local people they don't they are not forthcoming they don't we don't see the where can we get them so they were asking questions around then me can you imagine as a young man i raised my hands and at that time i think in 19 okay 2002 i think i must have been 30 years or something i was 30 years somewhere so then i raised my hands then the minister pointed at me can you stand up then i said look my name is ebongandu i'm a civil engineer and i've worked in a consultancy firm for about 3 years and i'm ready to to form a joint venture with any company i know how to prepare tenders i mean proposals i know how to prepare tenders and i know how to run a consulting firm so if there if there is any company i can uh, i can I should be given an opportunity so the minister was very was very surprised so he told me what should them you are very young i said yes sir then he said so you want to form a company i said yes you don't want to work i said no i want to form a company and i'm looking for willing partners so that's that's when now a gentleman called peter ian moro he, he i mean he didn't he didn't talk to me just there but he identified me then afterwards because the minister said look whoever wants to uh, form a joint venture please get in touch with him so during lunch time after the the conference had ended so we went for lunch that's when when i was on the the what you call the queue for the food then somebody comes one of the organizers said look when you get your food there's a gentleman called peter yen moro he wants to sit on your on your table i said okay fine so that's how now i went and sat on that table i saw this white man come and sat next to me and said my p my name is peter yen moro why don't we work together i'm from uwp consulting you know we want you to look i can't promise you but i want to invite you to south africa the way you spoke was very i liked your audacity you are very brave and i think this is what we have been looking for so i want to invite you i don't care whether you are young but you should come to south africa next week and let's see how we can work together and the following week i went to south africa in fact there was something interesting um you know i was so broke because i didn't have any money uh when he was spoke he was speaking to me then he told me so look uh, why don't you come tomorrow morning uh we have breakfast together no he, he invited me for dinner why don't you come for dinner at the holiday inn which is now southern sun so it's come at the holiday inn and uh we can have dinner together so we can extend this discussion then i told him okay fine uh but you know what um i don't have any money to come to holiday inn in the evening because the only transport i have now is for me to go back so in the evening i can't so he took out a hundred dollars he says okay how about this i said okay this is a lot of money i will change it then i will return it i will return the change and he said okay fine you can have it so that's when he gave me that money then i went to a bureau to change change uh, the currency then i jumped in a minibus went to chawaba kompoka sorry then in the evening i again jumped back on the minibus until i dropped by pa pa parish pa civic center civic center then i walked to the holiday inn and i met him and we had dinner we talked and whatever then i gave him the money i said okay this is the money the transport man wants just this that's when he told me no no you're a very honest guy but you know able uh next week i need to be talking to you you need to buy talk time in your in your in yourself and I, i had a small phone which my gave my sister gave me which i used to use so he told me no no, no i'll give you thousand dollars so you have this thousand dollars you should be using it and whatever whatever small small things and just write in a in a notebook um what is i mean like what you're doing with it and whatever so i went back home then a week later he invited me to south africa 
We went to South Africa there, I had a meeting with him, and it went very well. And they, after the meeting, they said, no, we, we, we've made a decision. We want to form a, a branch in Zambia. Now, and we want to form this branch in Zambia. We don't want it to be linked to South African company directly, but it should be an SPV, like a special purpose vehicle, which should involve you, Ebo, and ourselves. And we run it as a separate business in Zambia. And if it fails, you will have failed, we will have failed. We pull out, it's okay, we shake hands, and we say, look, we'll try something else. So they, t they told me, he says, Ebo, what do you think should be the name of the company? And as usual, I had, I had this Zambian mentality. You know where you have low self-esteem and all that, even if you are brave, but when you're confronted with such, you don't want to bring up your name because you think your name is not worth it. So at that time, I just said, no, why don't you call it UWP Zambia? I said, no. Remember, I want it to be an SPV. What about your name, Ebo? Then you say, well, what do you mean my name? It says, Nando. Why don't we call it Nando UWP Consulting? I said, no, 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 you can't do that. You know, no, one, no one cares about Nando. Look, what is, what is, it's very bad. <laughs> <laughs> I said, why don't you use UWP Consulting? Because, you know, Nando, look, Zambians don't like a local guy. They will just bring me down. And what, what, anything local is never liked. Because of Nando, be losing tenders. <laughs> saying, look, don't give them this. What? Then, I mean, this white guy, Peter, reminded me. But in your country, the Zuru borough. Okay, well, why is the Zuru is not recognized? Why, why, why is it that the Zuru is acceptable? Then I said, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're right. Okay. Let's go, Nandu UWP. So that's how they say, okay, Nandu UWP. Let's go, go and uh, um, go and do the paperwork, okay? Then I told them, I see, well, I still have the one thousand dollars because the hundred dollars I hadn't finished it. Which was, I was just using. Something. What do you mean? You mean you are not even using a taxi? To go? I said no. I'll jump. On, I mean, on a minibus. And then, you know, I'm used to that. It's okay. For now, I think let's deal with that. So that's why they, they told me, okay, fine, you go to Zambia. Go and register with PACRA and all that. So I went there, and at that time, PACRA was, I mean, small amounts of money to pay. So I, I got the forms, I registered and everything. I sent them on email, I scanned the documents, I sent them, this is, we have registered the company and all that. And that's how now they sent. They told me, okay, fine, open an account. I didn't even have a bank account. That's when I went to Stanbic, applied to open a bank account. Within one week, the account was opened. Then, my, by the way, my personal account, not company account. Then they sent eighty thousand dollars into my account. They told me, "Abel, we need to get authorization from South African Reserve Bank to send money, but we are sending you eighty thousand dollars as a seed money to start the business." It came into my account. Then now the white guy Peter came here, and he needed to talk to me. He says, okay, you've received money in your, in your account. Yeah, but the reason why we, we've put it in your account, we want to check your trust. You can eat that money if you want. We are going to run, first of all, from your personal account for now, for about a month. Of course, you'll be, you'll be keeping all the, the details, the expenditure. What, so he sent me, he came now and taught me how basic accounting, how to put books, how to buy files, and he told me, you, look, you need to look for an office, you need to look for a space and all that, you know. You need to register with Zambia, ZPPA, and all that kind of So I did all those registration and all that. Imagine I had $80,000 in my account, which I can withdraw anytime because I was only seeking to end in my personal <laughs> account. I ran it, I, I mean, I managed that, those funds for about two and a half months until I opened the... Sorry, I opened the, the bank account for the company and all that. That's when now, finally, after three months, I transferred that amount. That amount, I think it was 79000 somewhere there. Okay, equivalent. But now it was changed into Kwacha. It was changed into Kwacha. I started now, I started even recruiting employees now. I had my secretary, who was a stroke cleaner, you know. Then I had my driver, because I didn't know how to drive. So they bought... At first, they, they told me, okay, fine, we're going to buy you a car. The first car that I bought, of course, it was a loan from the company. It was a Mark II. So a Mark II, 
At that time, there used to be Chaser and the Mark II. You know, yes. It was a big, for the young people, it was an in thing at that time. And that was in 2003. So you know, they bought me a Mark II, and the rest is history. And I started now running a company. That company, Nandu UWP, by the way, the symbol of the company was very interesting. It was a flag, eh? Yeah, so the logo was a flag. On that flag, which, like, on the flag, is written Nandu. Then there was a mast, like a pole. Then down there, it was being held by UWP. So it was Nandu UWP Consulting. Now they told me, do you know the meaning of that? We are going to raise your name since you are complaining to say, look, Zambians don't worry. So put a flag so that everyone can see that that's Ngando. And as UWP, since we've got a good name, we are going to hold that poll as a foundation to it. So it was very interesting and very inspiring. And that's when they told me, Ebo, you are a flag now. So everyone in Zambia must know you. But you must make, you must fly that flag. So that's how now I started working very hard. I worked very hard, Sui, from being one employee to 48 employees in, in six years. And turnover, from zero turnover to about five to six million dollars. You know, when, when I tell people, you know, when you mention six million dollars, it's just because of a bad exchange rate now. Six million dollars at that time. If you change it in Zambian culture, it was, okay, of course it was a lot of money. Even now it's a lot of money. But it was far less money than what it is now. Now if you, if you change the six million dollars in, in, in culture, it's scary stuff. Okay, but at that time it was not scary. And I can understand why even young people, when they see, oh, six million, ten million dollars turnover, they are so scared. So it's, how possible is that? Because the $10 million turnover is $200 million quite. And everyone is scared. But at that time, can you imagine the exchange rate was below 10? Okay? Let's say it was four quite. So $10 million multiplied by four. It was just four million quite. Can you imagine? That was, so it was not something. Can you imagine 200 million to four million quite? That was $10 million. So it was not something which was scary. I mean, oh, sorry, 40 million quite at that time. So it was not something which was scary to us. Getting 40 million kwacha, it's normal. Now compare now, 200 million. Now when young people see that they are scared, they shouldn't be scared. So for me, uh, I think I was surprised that a civil engineer without any experience in running a company, without a degree in accountancy or basic knowledge in accountancy, no knowledge in management, you know, I ran, of course I was being taught. They taught me basic accounting. They taught me management and all that. I put up systems and all that, how to run a company. Fast forward to now. I know how to run companies. Not only my company, I've run companies like UBA. United Bank for Africa, I was a board chairman for UBA. And under the Banking and Financial Services Act, the one who is in charge of a bank is the board. And the chairman is very crucial. So you can imagine where even I was given now responsibility to run another company. So from somebody, again, even in your beer, no banking experience, nothing. But I'm very grateful to your beer because they gave me that opportunity and they trained me. They, of course, they sent me to different places. And your beer has got a very strong training programs for even the directors and all that were exposed to that. And I'm happy that I have that experience of my, on how to run a bank. For, for many young people, that is the situation they're in. You find I go to Unza, I do a degree in like engineering, for example, but most of them find themselves in entrepreneurship because they just find themselves there. How then do they still manage to sustain that? Because in your experience, that happened for you, and look at what you did to Nandu Consulting and yes. where it is today. For other people it would have stored and even maybe failed to grow. And you say, ah, we understand he has no experience in business, so yeah, it's expected. Exactly. First of all, that's why I'm saying that everything starts with you. You know, I'll tell you, uh, success is not for faint-hearted people. It's for people who are brave. You know, you have to be a crazy guy. Even you, Sui, I'll tell you, there are people who call you crazy because you don't give up. They look out, oh, there's a podcast. Ah, this guy, where is he going? 
Have you seen that he's formed a podcast again? We thought he's, he's no longer. Recently, I think you, you got another job. You know this. Ah. So look, he's gotten another job. He's, he's, he's moved higher. But again, he, he's, he can't let go of a podcast. You know, this podcast was not there, but you formed it. So you have to be somebody who's crazy because success is not for faint-hearted. The reason why it's not for faint-hearted because the rewards are too much. You know, the difference between an entrepreneur who is successful and an employee, I'm telling you, is different. You have unlimited resources. I mean, in terms of meeting the basic needs, I, when I talk about unlimited resources, you can literally afford anything. You can afford a good car. You can afford a, you can go to any hotel you want. You can go to any country you want. You can fly business class. You can look at that. It gives you choice. You know, in money, first entrepreneur will give you wealth. Wealth will give you choices and freedom. You can do anything you want. But when you're an employee and you're poor, you have no choice. In fact, your life is dictated by others. So young people must know that for you to make it in life, you have to be different. And you have to be this. It doesn't matter even if you wear I mean, if I showed you some of the pictures where I'm coming from. In fact, one time I'll pick up some pictures. I'll, I'll come and show you. So that you see my pictures at Libala, pictures in Chawama, you know, look at my brothers and all that. Then people realize, it's, okay, is this the guy we're dealing with? Is this the guy who is driving that nice car? And is this the guy who comes on TV? Is, this, is he the EIZ president? Can you imagine? First of all, okay, being a businessman is something else. But surely being EIZ president is not easy. You know, I'm a president for engineering professionals. And these are top, look, here, so we, if I look at in this studio of yours, which is very beautiful, by the way, Thank you. everything is engineering, the lighting system, the paint, this is chemical engineering, they sit here, the table, the building is civil engineering, everything here is, is engineering. So our economy sits on, on engineers. So you can imagine I'm the president for the engineering professionals in the whole country, and I'm the president for two terms. And these are intellectuals. You've got professors, you've got doctors, you've got technicians, technologists, people who work in the mines, in all sectors of the economy. They look up to me. How did I become EIZ president? Because I'm determined. I'm somebody who said, look, I can do it. I can provide that leadership that is required for EIZ to move forward. And that's why I'm here. So you can imagine... It's a burning desire in my heart. As an entrepreneur, as a human being, I said, you know what? I need to make a difference. Even when I was an entrepreneur, I realized, I said, you know, for me to be an entrepreneur alone, that's not enough. I need to create enough network to feed into my entrepreneurship, to feed into my personality, to build me up. And how do I build that? I said, okay, let me start, let me go. First of all, I didn't just join EIZ. Because I'm, I'm a consultant, I'm a consultant, I joined Association of Consulting Engineers. Again, in the Association of Consulting Engineers, I sat on the council there, like, which is a board. I rose, I was, I was honorary secretary. I became honorary treasurer. Then I became a vice president for Association of Consulting Engineers, for consultants in this country. Then I became a president, two terms, as a consulting engineer. I'm president of Association of Consulting Engineers of Zambia. Then at the same time when I was a president of a social consulting engineer, I became a president for EIZ. I'm one, in fact, I'm one of the few, if not the only Zambia, to have held two positions of engineering professionals at the same time. I was, in 2020, I was president for a social consulting engineers. I was also president for engineering institution of Zambia. Why? Because of conviction. For you to, be, to, to make it in life, you have to be crazy. You have to be different. You have to stand out. So you should not, and you, you shouldn't care where you come from. So I'm aging young people. The attitude I see in Zambia, they aim so low. They're so low. They're so discouraged. First of all, you don't need money to make it in life. What you need, first of all, is yourself. For me, that's the most important thing. Young people are so discouraged. I, I hear them. 
Sometimes the economy is not doing fine, and all those there are all these challenges which are there. But I'll tell you, it's not the economy. It's the person. I mean, we've lived in bad economy than even this one. But we survived. First, I want to age young people. They will not die. No matter how bad the economy or no matter how good the economy is, they will, not, they will still be there. But you know what's important in life? When you are surrounded with all these personal challenges, what do you do? How do you? Go out there. Interact. Walk to town. I told you I, I used to walk from, from Chawama to Libala Secondary School every day. And you know, we were so happy. Walking, can you imagine our shoe were bad shoes? But now when I look at my shoe, I wear nice shoes and all that. I mean, I wear a nice suit, a nice tuxedo, you know what? But you know, I'll tell you, that is, that has, that has not come from nowhere. That's after a lot of hard work. So young people, first of all, stop focusing on capital. Focus on yourself. Yes, go to school if you have to. In the meantime, you can go to school. If you can't afford school, go out there, interact with people. But I'll tell you, there's one catch. If you want to succeed, even as you interact, you interact with people and well, there's only one thing which will make you succeed. Honest. Integrity. When I say integrity, just be truthful. Don't steal from others. This basic stuff. Don't tell lies. Don't, ma don't make fake promises. If you make a promise, fulfill it. Okay. Don't associate with bad people. Don't associate with dishonest people. People will destroy your life by when they bring their brand to your life, they will destroy it. Don't. Don't associate with cut off bad people. They are not worth it. Associate only with good people. Yes, you meet bad people, but have uh what can I say? Uh, if there's something you should develop. De develop that instinct to identify danger. When you see danger, run away. Just cut it off. When you find people uh, taking you to bad vices at a very young age, people are doing, no, let's drink beer when you don't have money. You have not built up yourself. First of all, you yourself, you are a problem. Why? Because you have not achieved anything when you are a young person. First, build yourself up. Stay away from alcohol. Because it will mess you up. I'm not saying at some point you can't drink, you can. But first of all, look at yourself. He says, okay, fine. I can't even afford my own clothes. Somebody is buying for me. That's a shame eh, when you're a young person. But there's nothing wrong because, you know, life, you go through dependency, then you become independent like that. Then you become, you, because when you become independent, then you aim for interdependence with other independent people. So you have to make sure, you have to stand out. And people... Issue of integrity is very crucial. You find, you know, in Zambia here, people can just lie like that. Somebody can lie. Young people lying. You know, you're lying. Your life, you're, you know, you're leading a fake life. You want to project yourself that you have money and you don't have money. At the end, now you, start, you end up stealing. You end up... You don't do that. I'll tell you, you cannot pretend. Time will catch up with you. Stay away with that. Don't pretend that you've got money. Don't. Just aim. Aim yourself. Aim it. Build yourself up. Interact with people like Sui. And Sui, I'll tell you, there's what we call inspiration. Young people have a lot of inspiration to look for. In the country, in you, Sui Lange. You know, when you invite him, the first time I appeared there, I look at the way you, you are influencing the youth. The impact you are doing. You inspire me. You're part of people who inspire. I said, look, if a young man can inspire like that, even for me, even as I lead EIZ, I make sure that I inspire my members. I have to lead by example. You know, I have to show people, I said, you know what? You can make it in life. And that's why for me, my key focus, even in EIZ, is entrepreneurship. Because I've identified, I said, you know, the, the government cannot create the employment that you need. The employment must be created by the private sector. And that's true entrepreneurship. That's why I'm looking forward. When I look at you, so we, I know five years, ten years from now, you run a big broadcasting network. You have to believe in it. Because that's how you do it. 
do not plan and young people again when you enter entrepreneurship don't think you will make it in five years yes you'll be comfortable if you are i mean you are, you put in a lot of work you'll be comfortable but you will not see the real benefits until it's 10 to 15 years and the reason why it's like that is because god has to stay, you have you need to be tested because you know Success is all about management, okay? So in 10 to 15 years, you are learning on how to manage the business, even how to manage yourself. Because when you are given money, suddenly it will kill you or you can kill people. So that's why God needs to prepare you first so that you know the importance of money and how to take care of it. You know, there was one time I was listening to Dr. Miles Monroe. He was saying that anything you fail to manage, you lose it. If you fail to manage your, your marriage, you lose it. If you fail to manage your life, you lose it, you die. If you fail to manage your money, it goes, you lose it. So anything you fail to manage, you lose it. Why? Because it requires management. And that's why God requires you to be tested. But young people nowadays, they're not ready to be tested. He has a small problem, he goes back, no, I'm looking for a job. But he wants money. He wants to drive a Bucati. He wants to drive a Range Rover Sport. He wants to drive. No, it doesn't come like that. A Bukati will only come to a person who is prepared for it. And a Bukati you find even our roads in Zambia. You can't drive a Bukati in Zambia because our roads, I mean, Bukati is too low and the speed is too powerful. I mean, you have a, 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 a vehicle which is 350 or 380 kilometers per hour speedometer. Where would you drive it in Zambia? So if you have to be, to be the person who drives a Bukati, then you have to, you have to run a business in such a way that you become a multi-millionaire, even a billionaire. Then you have a house in Germany, or even in South Africa. The reason why I've mentioned Germany in particular, in Germany there they are roads uh, they call autobahn. The autobahn, they are for fast cars. Those are beautiful roads. They are highly engineered roads. That's where you can go and drive your Bukati. So you can have a house there on holiday, you've got a Bukati there. And there's nothing wrong as Zambian to go and have a house in Germany, or even in the UK, or even in the US. And you can drive your Bukati there. And when you come here to Zambia where there are, these may be, the roads are not uh, as, as good as the autobahn, then you can drive your Range Rover. But you have to be prepared. You have to have the integrity and the focus. And when we say working hard, Waking hard, the way I've seen this youth in Zambia, is waking up 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and you think you can make it? You are just on social media. If, okay, if you're on social media, there's nothing wrong. But look at what they are reading. Maybe they're watching porn, they're what, what? No, you can't make it. When you're in social media, look at those podcasts, your podcasts. Look at inspiration. Look at Elon Musk. Look at, for me, I'll tell you, in my car, even now as I was driving, I was listening to different entrepreneurs speaking. You know, I listened to Elon Musk, where he has attended conferences. You know, there's a book I'm reading right now. It's called Risking It All by Elon Musk. You look at, and for us, you are scared of dying. Scared of dying, can you imagine? You can't even afford shima, please. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't be scared of dying? No, try it. You have nothing to lose. Okay, you have nothing anyway. So why not try it? <laughs> okay, I mean, look, you have nothing to lose. So, and, and this is, exa I mean, wh why am I saying this? I want to push our youth to the corner to say, if you have to die, die anyway, if you want. But make it in life. Make it in life. Don't be a criminal, no, but make it, push it. Because if you don't push it, and you know, again, I was listening, this morning when I was coming, I was listening to this, um, uh, there's, there's a, a certain pod, podcast. In fact, I haven't even captured the name. I think I can. I, I wish I can. Yeah, so that maybe it's something. It's called Pep Talk. It's an app. Okay? Pep Talk. It's an app like a P. Okay. okay? So in that Pep Talk, there's a lot of it to tell you what you want. Okay? And one of the th these things, was re they say choosing your enemy. Then I said, well, how can you choose your enemy? Then now they were explaining. He says, have you ever been in, an, you know, in a situation where you're taught, 
You will never make it in life. A person tells you that. Okay? Now, that person, you can frame him into an, in a positive enemy. Because that thing, to say, you will never make it in life. When you reflect on it later on, it will trigger an emotional response to you. So I'm nothing. Let me show him. So sometimes you choose these people like your enemy to say, look, let me show him. Let me show him. I will show him even if it takes 10 years, even 20 years, he will see. I want one day, he will see it, say, I've made it. I think you've, you've heard where somebody says, tell me it's not going to work. Tell me I'll fail. You know, somebody has told you, no, it won't work. Look, Ebo, look, this Ngandu Consulting, the name Ngandu will never be accepted. I was taught. Ngandu will never be accepted in this country. Forget about it. a local name, Ebo, doesn't work. Just choose some English name or something like that. People will accept it. And deny it. Let, let, okay, say that your company is owned by foreigners. That's when Zambians will support you. Yes, I know Zambians do that sometimes. But you know what? Things are changing. Nandu Consulting now is a household name. People know it. And they know it in a positive way. There are projects we have done. People have seen projects in this country, projects in Rwanda. We've done stadiums there. And these are Chan 2016 Africa Cup. It was held in one of the stadiums we designed and built in Rwanda. That stadium is called Huya Stadium. And it was built by Zambians. So are we not proud of that? Then somebody tells you, that's why sometimes you have to choose enemies. Somebody will tell you, okay, fine. You will never meet a person like me. Wherever you go, you will see. Choose that. No, you can never make it. In, you know, Sue. So you think you can run a broadcasting station? You will never make it. Look, CNN, it's too big, you. What are you talking about? But in South Africa, they are broadcasting station, which are very successful. In Nigeria, they are there. So why can't you make it? There are billionaires in Nigeria. There are billionaires in South Africa. Why can't you do it? So when you hear people like that, sometimes you get them as positive enemies. But you know what? You have to reflect what they tell you. Then it generates an emotional response. That's when you know an emotional response is very strong. That's when you say, I'll show him. So sometimes pick good enemies. You know, you know, like you can change it to a positive. If you say, you will never make it in life. Do you know if you take a negative enemy, that statement will kill you. It will bring you, it will lower your self-esteem. But you know, for young people, I challenge them. Change that to a positive enemy. Just say, you know what, I'll show you. And you know, don't put a timeline. Just say, I'll wait, even if it takes 50 years, even if I have to die on my grave, if on my grave to show you to say, this guy worked so hard, he changed the narrative. That is what we want Zambian young people to be. And I'm happy, I've seen a lot of young, this is that Moses Zulu. This is another young man, I know him. He, he speaks to me, we talk, to, we, we talk. I've seen what he's doing. I think he does below the car park. I mean, the car parks, they organize these night markets. I think weekend markets. He's also doing it. Young, young people, look at you, Sui. You're doing it. And you've got a platform for young people. And you have no idea. This thing that you're talking will grow up. It's feeding into young people. They are looking at entrepreneurship or even life in a different way. For those that don't know, um, Engineer Ngando, how big is Ngandu Consulting? You know, um, first, Ngandu Consulting has got subsidiaries. We've got what we call ALD. Under Ngandu uh, Consulting, when we, we, uh, okay, when we started developing, we started as a consulting firm. Then we had a branch in Rwanda. Then we've got a branch in South Sudan. Then we've got ALD, Materials Limited. We've got ALD Engineering. We've got even Ngandu Energy, by the way. It's coming. It will be launched maybe in the in, in the in the Capro. It's it's in the making. It might be launched in Rwanda or it might be launched in, in Zambia. Okay. We don't know where um they open, but we it's it's quite uh what what can we are just it's it's on the drawing board. Um if you look at our turnover, 
Now, if we combine Rwanda and Zambia and South Sudan, our turnover is more than $10 million. But I can tell you, are we happy? No. We are not happy. Me as ABO, we are still pushing it. We want to make sure that NAND Consulting grows to, work, to be one of the biggest consulting firms in the world. We want to be able to be doing one project worth a billion dollars. And we are the main project manager. And what is the vision of Ebong and or even Nandu Consulting? We want it to be an EPC. Okay. EPC, what is EPC? It's engineering, procuring, and contracting entity. A one-stop shop for engineering. We want people, for example, Suwi, if you want to build the biggest broadcasting station in Africa, you require the designers to design it. You require the engineers to do all the lighting system, the whatever, to build the building, maybe to, maybe to be an upstairs and whatever, to be a massive complex, car parks and everything. And you'd want people, you don't want to call different consultants. You just call an EPC. It says, none to EPC. Can you tell us, can you tell us, or can you, design for us and build for us this broadcasting station. Our budget is $100 million. Then we build for you. If you go to the U.S., if you've seen the Apple headquarters, that building is worth between 4 to $6 billion. They engaged what they call EPC. They designed it and built it. Of course, the architect was Sir Norman Foster. But once it's designed, it was given out to the EPC. Because you know what? Steve Jobs, that's not his business to be building a building. He needed the best guys who could build, who could, who could realize his dream, exactly what he wanted to, and look at the Apple complex. And for me, I'm here to tell you this. That's the kind of vision we want, where you build something which is lasting and inspires generations to come. Because when you build a business, by the way, Sulanj, it should not be about you. It should be a legacy. When you build it, I want Nandu Consult or Nandu EPC in future to be run by different people. When I retire, it should go on. Let it build in South Africa, in Zambia, in Malawi. It should have branches all over. And we should, it should be a household name, not only in Africa, but in the world. So that even when Americans are coming, I'll tell you, look at it. Zambia now, has, it's, it's a spotlight where Americans, they want to invest in Africa and all that, they're talking about Zambia and all that, investment opportunities. Now, can you imagine Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, I mean, okay, the, the Elon Musk of this world, they want to invest in Zambia, okay? Look, it is cheaper to use a, a local, specialized, you know, high-quality type of company to build what they want to do. But if they don't find locals, what do they do? They get it from the United States. They bring them here. Those guys from the U.S., when they come here, they are very expensive because they have to, first of all, they have to take into account transportation to come to Zambia, establishment to Zambia, to, you know, creating new contacts and all that, and all that. It becomes very expensive. So the same project will be, for example, more costly by 20, 30, 40% because they got a company from from United States to come and do it here. But if they are investors, because their main aim is to make money, they want to work with locals. If they want a broadcasting to say, look, we want to showcase what we are doing, they would want to film it with your company, so we. Say, no, you, look, there is a company in Zambia which produces the same quality as CNA. So what we have done, we have engaged them because they are cheaper, okay? They are going to film everything, do documentary for us, and they will just send the films to us and will air them on CNN. And CNN will not say no because the quality of production matches them. That is the kind of companies we want to create in Zambia. Engineer Ngandu, you, at, at personal level, you pretty much look like you know, you've arrived. Do you feel you've arrived? Because for me, I feel like 
you're living the dream life. Every time I see you with a different car, I've never seen you drive the same car twice. Um, do you still have ambition for like where you are for you and your family? Or now it's just about Ngandu Consulting? No, no, but I'll tell you one thing. I haven't arrived. This is just beginning. I can just say I'm comfortable. I mean, look, we're talking about billionaires. We're talking about Elon Musk. Okay. For me, it's not about money. Of course, look, I want, we want, if there are billionaires in this world, if there are these Elon Musk and all that, and Elon Musk, by the way, the father even lived in Zambia. He worked in the copper belt, somewhere in the copper belt. If you read his, his, his life, they have got, I think they had an emerald mine or something in, in the copper belt. So Elon Musk, can you imagine? Elon Musk passed through Zambia. Then he was born in South Africa. Then he went to United. He immigrated to United States, by the way. He was not born in the U.S. So, can you imagine? Look at the impact that he has created. And what is his vision? To make human life interplanetary. Look at that dream. The vision looks impossible until you see the rockets that he has made. The ones which are reusable. When you launch it, it comes back, it lands back anyways. And just to describe, I can tell you, if you look at the Elon Musk, the way they say it, that rocket comes maybe at the speed of a bullet, more than a bullet. Then it slows down. Then it comes to run. Can you imagine slowing down a bullet until you catch it? So that's the kind of uh, craziness that you require to change the world. So for me, I can tell you, I'm comfortable. I'm not rich. I'm comfortable. Imagine we're talking about affording a car. We're talking about affording a house. That's not being rich. Look okay, here, having employees, maybe having 300 employees. Okay, fine. No. We want, I'll tell you, we need to change Zambia. We need to be entrepreneurs who can employ a minimum 100,000 employees. Not only in Zambia, but across the world. We want Nandu Consulting to have not less than 10 million shareholders. 10 million. If you want, please, just check. Find out how many shareholders are in Google. Because these are listed companies. There are millions of shareholders. Find out how many shareholders are in Facebook. you find there are tens and tens of millions, 6 million, 10 million, 20 million shareholders. Because these are listed companies. That is what we, are, we need to. Because this is not about a person. Where you hold on to a company, no, Mr. Nand, Mr. Nand, no. We are talking about, you, ch you check the shareholders. For Google, how many shareholders are there? Um, we haven't found the number, but I've seen that the, it says Bryn Sergey is the largest individual Google shareholder. He owns 367 million shares. Okay. And that's 2% of the company. <laughs> yes, exactly. You see, that's 2%. 300 million. Okay, do you know, when you, you see that, 300 million shares. Eh? Do you know shares? One share can be owned by an individual. But it just happened that he owns all these together. Okay? But if you check the number of shareholders, but later on you see that they have got so many shareholders. Look, they have got corporate bodies as shareholders. They have got individual shareholders. You know, who owns shares in, in, in Google? Yeah, because I'm seeing uh, there's this J.P. Morgan Chase & Company has got 95.9 million share, shareholders. Yes, exactly. No, those are shareholders. Yes. And, you know, they're talking about shares, not the value of shares. If you want, now you multiply 95, 93 million, multiply it by the value of the share. That's when you know now the total shareholding they have. So what I'm trying to say is that you need to bring, first of all, what's the future of a company? You know, a company... First of all, it starts as an, an individual. Then you bring in other people to be shareholders, maybe two or three. Okay? Then you run it. The future of your company, when it grows, when your idea becomes so big and you grow it, you need to list on Losaka, Losaka Stock Exchange so that you can bring in other shareholders. And that's how you raise money. You know, Zambians, they think the only way you can raise money is in the bank. Look at the interest rates in the bank. There are many. I'll tell you a basic example. Look at this Chilimba. That's basic. Where people put in and whatever, and then at some point money matures and whatever then you share. That's exactly a very brilliant way. But that, that is a very basic way of doing things because you can only raise 
Okay, maybe 100,000, maximum 120, that's it. But we are talking about where you can raise $100 million from Zambians. Do you know, I'll tell you, there are 18 million Zambians. Even if, even if say, you target, so okay, in Lusaka, there are 4 million or 5 million. If you want to raise 5 million from Zambians, it's okay, please, can you contribute one question? People can afford the one quarter. They even even coins are even left on tables. But those are one quarter our coin. You know, put it together. It's five million quarter. So the way you run business in future, you have to look at the future. Say, okay, fine. Where is my business going? First, I grow it using my own effort. I grow it, but you reach a point where your own efforts can't. They're not enough. So you have to bring in now. You have to mobilize resources from others, and now you, you. You raise it on the Lusaka Stock Exchange. And that is how now you raise money and you start expanding. So for me, I'm comfortable. I'm not rich. You, you, you are in your, in your 50s now. How is it running businesses at different ages? Running a business in your 20s, 30s, 40s, now where you are, how do you maintain that same momentum? Okay, first of all, that's a very good question. You know when you are young, I'm telling you this, uh, you are too playful when you are young. You make a bit of money. I've also been like that. But you know what you need? You need mentors. People are able to correct you. You know, there's nothing wrong. I mean, I remember when I made the money, okay, I, I made some money. Of course, it took me a bit of time to buy a Range Rover, maybe 10 years. But the moment I just had that, maybe I should have bought a Range Rover five years later. But anyway, 10 years later, I just saw in my account, oh, okay. When I just saw somebody selling a range, oh, let me buy it. I bought it, you know. Maybe I could have bought it five years later. But when I bought a range over, thank God I had mentors. They told me, okay, Abel, you've bought a range over. We know you've got excess capital. But please don't buy any more cars for now. If you have to buy a car, it has to be for business. Grow a business more. You know, so those are the challenges you go through. Then second, when you grow, let's say you're in your 30s, you know, I don't know for some reason. That's when you have a lot of haters for again. A lot, I mean, they just come in, a lot of haters, you know, they pray for you, I mean, look. <laughs> so there's a lot of nonsense during the 30s, okay? Then I don't know whether, because people don't believe that you can make it. They don't believe that you're driving a good car, and they don't accept. But you know why? After, as you approach towards 40s, they start accepting. I don't know, maybe they say, okay, he's mature now. But they accept. They say, okay, he can own a Benz now. He can own a Range Rover. He can own whatever things are. But you still now, you have different sets of haters who come in. Maybe now they'll start questioning your, your morality. Okay? Because they know they can't, they can't attack you in your business. So now they attack your morality. So you have to keep on... By the way, you should thank God for your, for your haters. Do you know why? They know your weaknesses. When your haters point out your weakness, thank them. Because that's the time to correct yourself. You know, because, thank God you have haters. Because okay, some hate, okay, others you ignore them. Of course, the hatred, some, some of it is petty. But most of the things they'll talk about will be correct. Because you are successful. And I'll tell you, the moment people stop talking about you, you are dead. Even if you arrive, you are dead. Just know you, you're, you're not important. People must constantly talk about you. But you should pay attention to what they are saying. Because most of it is very important for you. Because you know what? They know that, okay, they, they cannot bring you down in the other areas. They just identify just one thing so that they can rub it through you. But you, when they tell you, say, oh, thank God. Oh, you've told me about this. I'll cut it out. You told me that this hand is bad? Out. Let me take out this vice out so that my haters can't talk about it. Yes. Okay. And, 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 and what are your thoughts on entrepreneurs who want to start business when they're older? Maybe say, no, let me work first 10 years. I raise capital. And then others even want to start business with retirement money. You know, um, first of all, look, you can succeed at any level. Okay. But that's dangerous. Because I'll tell you, when you get older, you have very less time to remaining. 
When do you rest? We know you don't, you don't rest. Of course, you have to work throughout your life. But when do you enjoy your life? Because there comes a time when you want to travel also. You know, you have to travel. You have to stay with your grandchildren. You have to move. I mean, this life. You have to go in the farm. Sometimes you're alone, maybe on the lake. You're on a boat cruise and whatever. You're reflecting on your life and all that. Maybe you're helping young people. When are you going to give back? Because, you know, there's never a time to say, let me wait. That's when I can go to... So let me wait, let me accumulate money. No, it doesn't work like that. You have to start. In fact, you have to start with nothing. First of all, you have to ask friends, can we work together? My friend, I don't have money, but can I join you? Can I, whatever? You have to find ways to start. Whatever you do, that's why uh, I think Martin Luther King said, you know, like, keep walking. You fall, wake up, keep walking, but just don't stop. And, and I'll tell you, for me, and this is my testimony, God opens doors for you at some point. When you are genuine, you are not, you've got integrity. You have cut, of course, I mean, as human beings, as a young person, there'll be time when you lied, and what, but you learn from it until you become a better person. Then, then you start, I mean, first you start, by the way, mistakes. You are going to make me. I've made mistakes, I'll tell you. Personal mistakes. I've made mistakes. A lot of mistakes in my life, which I regret. But you know what? Those mistakes made me who I am. You know, you make this mistake, somebody comes, hey, but why? Why have you done this? Because as you rise, there are consequences of what you do. Even when I started having money earlier on, I made mistakes with my own money. You know, you play around too much. You do this, then you reflect. Until some point, you say, mm, no, let me sit down. Let me reflect on my life. What is this? This money will kill me. Can I make sure that I do the right thing? Because you've got money. But now, look, I can have money. But I, just, I don't throw it around. Yes, there was a time, at that time, I think, I had my birthday, my 50th birthday. But I'll tell you so. I'll explain where I'm coming from. You know, I had a very uh, challenging uh, childhood. I mean, in terms of my, my background, which I explained. Now, can you imagine my, my own brothers, my two elder brothers, our firstborn and our secondborn, died before the age of 40. They never even reached 40. Then my older sister died at the age of 42. Okay? So I'm the only one in my family who reached the age of 50. Okay, and who reached the age of 50? Successful. Okay, now you can imagine, surely I'm not entitled to reflect on my life. And that is why, for me, I don't regret it. I enjoyed that 50th birthday. It was worth it because it was celebrating the troubles, you know, the, the, the grief that I went through, through my family, myself, where, I, you know, if I reflect back, then imagine you reach the age of 50. You have to enjoy it with your friends. You celebrate your life. And you know, in the United States, or even in, in the UK and, or in Europe, look at the birthdays. Just Google them. Google birthdays of celebrities and Google how much money they spend. Because you know why? They reflect on their life. As long as you have not stolen that money. It was my money, so why should I explain it? And people should get inspired that to say, look, he used his money and he celebrated his 50th birthday. That was a landmark. I don't have birthdays every year. No. You, you've never heard of my birthday every year. No. But my 50th birthday was emotional in the fact that, one, I just lost my parents. I mean, I had my 50th birthday in 2022. I lost my parents in 2020, both of them. They were old. Okay. Then I was reflecting on, on my sister, my, 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 my brothers who died. Then I said, you know, I'm blessed. I'm very fortunate that I've even reached age 50. I didn't even know that my sisters, even my little, were worried. I said, look, the first born died, second born died, third born died. Then me, I'm the fourth born. So in their, in their mind, it was, they had this fear. He's the next now. It's almost like 
that's that's the sequence. Yeah. You know, because that's what happened in you know the first bond died first, the second bond died second, the third bond died third. So me, I'm the fourth one. So my, my relatives, all of them said, look, it will be him now. He might not even reach 50. People are saying they will never reach 50 and all that. People talk, they hate us. But imagine, pam, I reach 50. What do you think I could have done? I said, look, let me reflect, let me enjoy myself. And I don't regret it. And it was nice. And I thank God that I reached the age of 50. But now I'm 51. And thank God for that age. No, nah, we thank God. I just remember you want to chill with the big boys and, you know. The <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but I mean, it's, 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 it's worth it. Really. Exactly, it's worth it. And, I think in Zambia, we just have this thing for everyone must be, you know, secretive in how you... What, what, and to be honest, I feel like that is mostly like some sort of a poverty mindset. Yes. We gravitate towards... We gravitate towards poverty. You know, anything poverty, we, we pray, let's not celebrate poverty. We should hate it. Poverty should not be celebrated at all. Even on TV, you should project... Sometimes project people are successful. And uh, we are talking about genuine people. We are not talking about criminals. No. We are talking about people who have ended. People who have ended, we should celebrate them in our country. Here in this country, we destroy people. We've got this PhD syndrome. It's so prevalent. You know, I look at it, I said, what is wrong with this country? Look at it in Nigeria. Hmm. We've got Tony Lumelo. I met Tony. He appointed me a board chairman of UBA. The billionaire appointed me, a Zambian, to be a board chair for an international company from Nigeria. I ran it for three years. And we don't celebrate that. Oh, we hear is bad news, you know what, you know, you talk about the birthday, 15th birthday, you know. Why don't you say, oh, Abel was a board chairman for UBA. Who was, whatever was, all that is suppressed. The only story you hear, oh, celebrate, of course people must celebrate. But who is this person we're celebrating? Okay? What has he held? What is he? Can he afford what he's talking about? It's true. And even you, Sui, at the age of 50, at the age of any, any year, if you're successful, you look back and you look where you're coming from. Enjoy your life. And don't hide. Why should you hide? Why should you hide? If you're a criminal, come, come and investigate me. That's it. But uh, that's genuine money. That's it. So in life, for, for me, I think as a country, we should celebrate successful people. Young people, young or old, whatever it is, we should celebrate. Sometimes we should even fume, say, okay, uh, you know, okay, Abel's crib. You go to, to the house, fume it. Let people see it. Just invite me. I'll come. You know? No, I mean, look, I mean, that's, that's exactly. At some point, I'll invite you. Yeah. Definitely, I'll invite you at some point. Because to be honest, I yeah. feel like we need these stories. Yes. Because to be honest, Zambians feel, especially young people, they feel like you can only go, you, you, you only go as far as you're exposed. Exactly. And if the person I'm exposed to just has a house in Chalala, and yes. I feel like that's it. Exactly. And you know what? That's why people, you find Zambians, you find he's built a good house, he's hiding. Why should you be you should be should you be hiding in your in your own country? What, what what kind of culture is that? You know, we should be able to work hard. We should celebrate that. You know, look at our own president, H. Look at his beautiful house. And that's where he's staying. Look at that. And people saw it, community house, they have seen it. Because he worked for it. He worked, he earned it. He didn't build it now. He earned it when he was a businessman. He, and he's still a businessman. And people should celebrate it. But look how many people have demonstrated, uh, I mean, I've shown their houses. They are scared. Even on Facebook, you know, if a child gets a picture of him, no, delete it, please, they'll kill me. Why? Why should we, this PhD syndrome must end. And you know, we should be talking about it. I mean, even you, Sui, under this podcast, you should be condemning this PhD syndrome. It's pathetic, and I will tell you, it's not good for the country. Zambians must be promoted. For me, I put Zambians first. We need to promote Zambians, I'll tell you. For me, actually, my dream is to see the first billionaire in dollars, a Zambian. And for me, I'm pushing. I'm pu it might not be me. I might not reach the promised land. But other people, young people like you, they'll, they'll reach it. They'll even say, look, Engineer Ebongan started this. Yeah. He's the one who said, look, this thing can be done. We want to see in future where a Zambian is celebrating a birthday in Zambia here. $10 million. 
He spends on the birthday. He enjoys it because he sends money. He's got charity, he's got what, what, he's invested, whatever, he can enjoy his money, whatever you want. And I like your point about we glorify, um, you know, this poor mentality so much because you find it's okay for you to post people on social media who need help, avuti, cash, that's Ex- right. Yes, exactly. But the one who's doing very well, yeah. you want to condemn. You, you want to condemn. But because what's the point of posting on avuti? Because you yeah. uplift him, right? Ex- exactly. So yes. he's uplifted. No, no, you can't talk yeah. about him. Yeah, you can't talk about it. <laughs> you can't show him. No, no, we can't show him. I mean, what is that? And, and I, I'll tell you, we have to stop that nonsense. There is no way. Zambians, first of all, we are very brilliant, by the way. I've interacted, I'll tell you. I, I've sat on forums. I was in the World Federation of Engineering Professionals, I mean, organiz- in the World Congress in Prague, in Czech Republic. We interact with everybody. We are as good as the world can offer. I've interacted, I'll tell you. I was in Singapore, in FIDE conference there. You go to Singapore. You interact with the best engineers in the country. You go there, you're discussing, you sit on discussion table, you're talking. You know, Zambia winning awards in Singapore, Association of Consulting Engineers. I mean, we interact, we talk there. I was in South Africa on what, uh, what, what do you call UNESCO Engineering Week. I was on discussion panels. You sit there, you're talking, people are listening from all over the world. You're talking, they're listening. From a Zambian engineering professional, from a Chaoma boy, I'm talking from Chawam. I'm talking. People are listening. Okay? I'm in South Africa. I'm staying in a very good hotel. A Chawam boy. Which I can afford, by the way, myself. So why can't we highlight those good, good stories? The only thing you post is just poverty. Poverty. Po- what kind of poverty? No. I mean, are you telling me in Zambia there are no successful people? No, there are many. They might not be millionaires in dollars, but they are successful. They are enough to inspire the other generations. If you check, I'll tell you, no wonder our youth are discouraged. Because they have, they have never seen anything good. And when they show a good person, a successful, look at the way they attack him. And I'm happy, look, there's one thing I liked. When my, the issue of my 50th birthday went on, on media, I, I liked the way the youth responded. I'm telling you, maybe less than 5% negativity. 95% were positive. They say it's his money. Yes. He says he has ended. Look, he works hard. That's a fact. Leave him alone. And I was very, do you know what I liked? Because now Zambia has arrived. Zambians know now they can see mediocrity. Say, no, no, this is nonsense. We are not going to put up with this. The 5%, they tried. But people condemn them and say, look, you can't talk about that. You know, they don't even know that we help charity quietly. Okay. You know, when you help out, you don't publicize. No, I, I fund this charity. I fund it. That's not our culture in Zambia. But we, we, we do help in charity. We, we do. We, we help out on this. And, and on the charity, uh, Engineer Angandu, because I, I, I had a different view. If you help out someone, yes. I feel like you must put it out there. Yeah. So you inspire others to help as well. Okay. The problem I that we have, point, yes. the problem that we have is... It's okay for someone to post negative things on social media, okay? Yes, yes. But the moment someone posts something positive, oh, we help this person out. To be honest, there are others who feel like, oh, there are those guys. Those are going to help out. Oh, Danny, imagine I, I if agree. every Zambian yes. is helping someone. Yes. What no, kind no. of country are we going to have? I think, you but know, now, even helping, you want to condemn helping. No, no. In fact, uh, so we, I think in the coming years, we'll tell you we, are, we help. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be publicized. Yeah, because look at Bill and Menda Gates Foundation. Yes, it's open. Everyone knows what yes, they're doing. They're coming to Africa. They're it, doing a business. No one open. is condemning them. It's open. Yes. No one ever posted. No, yes. what you do, do it in private. No, no, no look no, at the, the impact of uh, uh, Bill Gates. Yeah, Bill Gates. Yes, look at even on the COVID. Yes, these vaccines. It's research funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And they openly talk about yes, no one exactly. is condemning. Yes, exactly. But if a Zambian helps and says, "No, I've given, I've paid school fees for this one." Ah, no. Oh my God, where has he gotten the money? Whatever, you please ACC, DC. Now imagine if you have oh someone says, "Ah, that guy pays school fees." Even, let me let me see what I can do. Oh, yeah. I've also done this for this. Person. Exactly. Yes. Every Zambian is even even just hoping one. And, and and you know what they don't know, even Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Do you know that uh, they administer money for? Uh, Jeff Bezos, and also money for this guy. What's, what's it, what do you call it? Warren Buffett? Warren Buffett. Well, yes, he gives the money for charity. He gives it to Bill Gates. Well, then they see where they need to Yes. Be. So apart from Bill Gates, his money, now, because he was doing such a good job, the other guy said, we don't have time to set up a separate foundation. We'll be funding you. So in a similar manner, actually, agreeing with you, 
That is where when they see what you're doing, even other people can bring one quarter, two quarters, and look, I think Nandu Consulting Foundation is but is better organized. Yes. They target the, the correct public and whatever. Maybe let's donate money there. You're right. Because we because should, the, 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 here's a funny thing. Because I've, you've seen banks donate desks to this school, donate yes. what? No one condemns. Yes. But should an individual go and donate desks? No. Why are you putting on Facebook? Yeah. Why? You, you know, that, that's exactly the point. In fact, you're right. We need to stop that. I totally agree with you, Zoe. We need to stop that. You can donate money. You can donate uh, materials and whatever to orphanages, to people. You can help out people. And I'm telling you, there are people, look, in fact, you're right. We'll be documenting such things so that people know. Yeah. Because people people must know that people help out. And the, and the helping, there is, you know, there is, there is goodness in helping another human being. Because even the Bible said, God blesses you so that you may be a blessing to others. Yeah. And I'll tell you, blessed is the hand that gives, not the hand that receives. He has blessed the hand. There's nothing wrong in the hand that receives, no. But God, what God has blessed is the hand that gives. You can't keep on receiving, no. You have to give out so that you can receive also. So you find that, I, I, I totally agree with you. So in this country, and I'm happy you've spoken about it, this PhD syndrome in this country, that's something, by the way, that is the single reason, single most reason, why we don't have a billionaires in this country. Because I'll tell you, it is, it is a cancer which has spread in the entire society, and we should fight it. Because I'll tell you, with anything good, we condemn it. Anything with money, by the way, not even anything good, anything with money. How can, can you imagine? Money is the most important, even in the Bible it's mentioned. But here, anything with money, we want to kill it. Other countries, they celebrate. Anything with money, anything where money is, where somebody is making money, is contributed to community, they support. There was, there was a, a Nigerian that came on the podcast, Ade, yes. and he said, um, I'm surprised that you guys in Zambia here, people with money even build high offenses, no one knows them, they're hiding, they're what? Yes. He's like, in Nigeria, no. If you have money, you are known. Yes. And it is your responsibility to also help others. Yes. Because you are known. Yes. We believe that our society grows through those who are the well to do. Yes. Are exactly. the ones that show up for others. Yes. But here in Zambia, the well to do are hiding. Yes. Because they'll be judged, they'll be condemned. No, in Nigeria, the well to do, they look. He says, if you, sh if, if you throw a wedding in Nigeria, you deserve to like, no, people will just come. Yes. Why? Because we celebrate the wealth of others, and that's yeah. the thing that we have. That's, and that's why you see Nigerians are successful everywhere. Everywhere in the world, yes. yes. They're not. Yes. They're and they're, I'm, oh, because I'm, success, I, I'm successful now, I put my other friends, oh, they, I, where's the opportunity? I know that one. That one, come, bring the one. And those guys. But here in Zambia, are successful, you have to be the only one. I mean, you want to hide because you, you know. Look at, look, look at in, in Qatar, when there was a World Cup. Look at the songs which were played in, the, in those stadiums. Yeah, Nigerian Nigerians. songs. Look at the dominance. I mean, look at... You can see the millionaires. They drive private. Look, I used to, I used to go to Nigeria, especially when I was at UBA. I used to go to attend for meetings and annual general meetings there for the UBA. When you go to the other airport, you go and see the private jets, like taxis, private jets. You are talking about Gulf Streams, different Umbria, what? Like taxis. Here, you just buy a helicopter. <laughs> you see the way they will haunt you first. <laughs> and then some of the only two, only, uh, helicopters, they're just $500,000. There's nothing special about the helicopter. Some of them are, are even $300,000. You can buy it second hand. But you buy that second hand, bring it in Zambia. Say, no, I use it for my farm. I, look, look, I'm, you will see the way they No, I think the foundation First of all, to was... get even the license for that, you'll be, you'll be shocked. And yet to get it, it should be the easiest. So, oh, oh, Eliza, okay. Like, I mean, you get it. Because we celebrate our own. Yes, you celebrate your own. But in this country, that is something we should... Actually, I'll tell you, Zoe, if there's something that every time on the podcast, you should always say it under, under conclusion or in the middle part or whatever, it should be this PhD syndrome. It should always be condemned. We have to fight it until this thing is wiped out. We should be celebrating wealth in this country. Yes, we should be condemning people who are corrupt, People are criminals, yes. But people have ended, no. We should make sure we celebrate them. 
I think that thing started a long time ago. You know, I think, and I always talk about this, when you were at school and uh, you write your tests, your exams and results come out yes. and your parents are, you know, condemning you for failing. It's easy to say, no, ah, but tinafiru, what's it, tinafiru, no one passed. Hey. So you find that the kid that passed, you, you want to bring him down hey, because yes, he's yes. making you look bad. Hey. So hey. you want to, all of you should be at the same yes. level. Anyone, at, who at rises, the level. Uh, anyone who rises... Look at that, that nonsense. I mean, look, if that is our attitude, how can you win? How can you produce? First of all, so we, I'll tell you this. If you look, first of all, there's a difference. I'll tell you, let me give a very basic difference how just wealth is very different. You know, when you drive a Range Rover Sport, I tell you to say, mm, jump into it. And I also tell you, after you drive a Range Rover Sport, I tell you, come out, pack it here. Jump into a Vitz. And by the way, I'm not condemning a Vitz. It's good for <laughs> beginning and whatever. But the difference, my friend, it's phenomenal. You can see what wealth gives you. It gives you comfort. It gives you freedom. It gives you flexibility. You jump into a Mercedes-Benz. Or the Lexus that I'm driving, the LS500, you enter there, you drive it. Look at the difference. And you tell me to say, no, money is evil. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> yeah? Try to, you know, try to walk. <laughs> then try to drive a Vitz. Okay, you try me because, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> okay, the other one is climate control. You enter there in the car. It adjusts on the climate. You are driving, it's quiet. The musical system there, Bang and Olufsen musical system, it's one of the most extreme musical systems is there. You listen to it, the sound. Then you go to this, you try, come by, like, you know something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know why I'm saying this? I'm just telling you this just to, to dramatize, to tell you, to say, look, we should know. Let's celebrate wealth. People are successful, we should celebrate them. It's very, very important. And small achievements, let's celebrate them. You know, you should actually, you know, I'll tell you, if you start fuming to say, you go to some of the most successful people in Zambia, say, can you fume your house? They'll say no. no because no, of sir. the PhD. Why should it be? You know, I've, I've, I've dined in some of, the, some of the best houses in this country. Beautiful, you cannot believe, better than even in South Africa. Owned by Zambians. You enter the house, you just say, wow. When you go back to your home, you say, no, no, take out this furniture. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, then you start, you know, you start saying, okay, fine. I think, look, I think I've been too scared. Can you take out this furniture? Take out this TV, replace it. Because of some of the best, some of the houses I've seen in this country. So you, you can imagine, and that is why we should celebrate Imagine how many good houses I haven't seen. Which are they? Which are hidden? Why should you? Because, you know, people succeed by inspiration. You know, I'll tell you, to make a decision, it's not easy. Even to stand up, you have to be inspired. You have to see, to say, you have to say, okay, look, you know, he made that decision, but look at where he's going. Look at how successful Sri Lanka is. I'm not sure. Six years ago, look at where Sri Lanka has, has reached. You know, so you can be encouraged because it's an inspiration. So inspiration is very important. And that's why you need to say, well, ah, can't there are Zambians who are like that. I'll tell you, because of interacting with them, I've entered some of the best homes. You enter there and say, oh, my God, my next house, they will see. I have to build my house this level. Because you, you even say, no, 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 if I buy an aircon, there are even people who say, I can't have an aircon, an aircon office, yeah. In my house, I can't. Who told you that an aircon is meant for the office? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is meant for your bedroom, for your children's bedroom, for your sitting room, dining room. What, your house should have an aircon. In fact, you have even centralized aircon. You enter there, there's an aircon system, very nice. It's hot now. Why can't you have aircon in your house? If you can afford it. Okay. But here, you know, Aircons in Zambia, even though they are for offices. When you come home, 
you are in the you are heated you know you're sweating all over the place na kafani kukona no it's true I, you, you know what i agree with you because they say you only go as far as you're exposed yes when you constantly see those that are succeeding you want to be you, like you want when you constantly see people who are poor well, who are driving you this, gravitate you, towards that that is what you, and, and, and everyone uh, who's successful you hate them and uh, yes and i'll tell you poverty pulls you it has got a very strong force poverty it pulls you and it's very bad so that's why people must stay away from poverty and, and because it pulls you down completely that's that's what it is riches pulls you up that's why exposure is very important me i travel a lot i've seen i'm telling you you go to united states i went one time you know i drove from uh, jacksonville to miami and as i drove through i passed through orlando florida where there is uh, where there is a disneyland you just was oh, okay, god what have we done you see first of all even when i went to the disneyland for the first time i said wow wow why can't we have this then i went to just to inspire myself in fact i bought even a rocket i got i got, I got a rocket called the atlantis at that time i went to kennedy space center you go and see what is possible what is it what human ingenuity has done then you even building a house you felt you're struggling people are, are going to space you go and see a piece of engineering there in the museum at the kennedy space center you know when i went there i said no this is greatness you know you walk there you can feel it you 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 see the people have done it they are human beings like you and me and you see we land you want you can't work hard to become one of the biggest entrepreneurs in this country or in the world you can't be a billionaire people have created forget about being and they have created things the atlantis at that time it was the most advanced engineering uh uh work ever assembled by a human being you go to kennedy space center and i went there to, i'll tell you for inspiration as i walked in those corridors i listened i went to this hall where they were now doing a projection on the movie they were showing jf kennedy the president of the united states and that speech where he says we do these things not because they are easy because they are hard that was the president inspiring the country he was challenging you know there was a competition between the soviet union and the united states he went in we do these things because not because they are easy because they are hard that's why you do them how many young people do these things because they are hard in fact you avoid what is hard yes <laughs> what is hard they don't even go there no what but in the united states that's why they do those things then when i went there i was i got inspired then i drove through you know as i drove through i i drove through palm beach i looked i said okay god I saw the wealth, the houses. And there are no offenses as the Nigerian was talking about. In the US house you look at of course look, you look at the landscape, you look at the houses, you look at the luxury. And all that by the way, no criminal man. Hard work. You ask the owners, they have worked their own companies, they own this, they own this, they own broadcasting, they are they are movie actors. You they are what very successful West Palm Beach where Donald Trump stays where the Mararago is you check my friend you just say what have we done are we cursed or what but you know we are not cursed it's a mindset we need to change that and when i started seeing those things when my mindset started changing when i started pushing that's when i realized i said it is possible even in zambia you can make money genuinely you don't need short no but you should make money with excellence if you are given like me I'm an engineer I'm given a job to supervise I must make sure there is excellence there this quality control and that's why even as grand consulting by the way very soon we shall be opening our new offices but they are done we have built a lab a laboratory for quality control because you've seen now, now of late buildings are collapsing everywhere as even me as he as it we are condemning that our disciplinary committee is busy 
Many cases of disciplinary committees are being reported in EIZ. Why? Because wrong people have entered our industry. You've got cadres masquerading as contractors. And tenderpreneurs. Engineers. Yes, tenderpreneurs. They are all over the place. But again, do you know why? I don't blame them. Do you know why? Because engineering professionals who are qualified, even professionals who are qualified like you and me, they are scared. They are cowards. They don't even know how to prepare a tender. Even to buy a tender, they are scared. Even to enter ZPPA offices, to enter, you take him there, he's scared to enter ZPPA. How can you be successful? Even to go to RDA, to go and find out how many things that you have, even to check online, they are scared. But they can go and watch all these things online, things which, are no, which have no value. I'm encouraging them, even my members, I want to encourage them. Be entrepreneurs. Go to ZPP, go and knock in office, keep on knocking. You knock, it doesn't do, keep on knocking until it is open. Even if you knock for 10 years until you collapse on that door, let it open for you. And that's how success people are. You know, there's one thing uh, Steve Harvey says. Success people, he gave an analogy, he gave an analogy. It's like jumping off the cliff with your parachute. Okay? Then now you're trying to take it out. You have, not, you have never run a parachute, but they hook you on the parachute, then you jump, jump out. Then when you jump through there, because you are, you are not experienced, eh? maybe you jump close to the cliff. So you get bruised, whatever, this thing, as it is going, you step there, you push a bit, you go in the air, you try whatever, and you, as you are going, then you just see your parachute comes out. Then you start rowing now, you come back. Then you come and pass through, on the same cliff, the people are scared, they see you. That's how it is. You need to be bruised. We want people to be, be ready to be bruised. First of all, you have nothing to show for as a person. There's nothing to lose. So why can't you just try out to be an entrepreneur? Take a look, you have nothing to lose. Okay? Maybe you are, you are eating one meal per day. What, what do you have to lose if you try out? And who said you cannot try out? And the people who have tried out, try, tried out like you and me, where are they? They are successful. So why can't the youth try out? Start. And this thing that I will tell you, you don't need money. Give me money. No. If you hear there's a meeting of entrepreneurs it's in Kawat and you stay in Chawab, walk. Pick up, take a cloth, whatever. Walk, walk. When you reach there, clean up your whatever. Sign, sign, enter there. And tell them, I don't have money. I came, but, but please, I want to listen to Suwi. I want to listen to Engineer Nand. I want him. I just want to listen to him to speak. And say out your ideas, what you have. Call Sui, Sui, me, and I'll tell you. A, and a, a good idea is like a two-edged sword. It pierces you. Any person you talk to about a good idea, he jumps. Whether he's rich, he's poor. When you just tell him, mm, where did you get this? Can you come and see me in my, in my office? That's what a good idea does. When you have it, it doesn't matter how poor you are. When you say it to anybody, that's why you don't need money to succeed. One, a good idea, it's just not a good idea, is how you say it. It's the passion. It's the emotions, the way you say it. It's your eyes, your facial projections. Do you know you know, I've seen people when they walk into the room. Okay, I'll give you an example. You have seen the way Malema speaks. When you see him, you know, you can even say, this is a future president of South Africa. You can see it. Why? It's not the crowds he pulls. The crowds go there because of the passion. When he's talking, he says self-hate. When he was condemning xenophobia, he told them, he says, you can't stand up to your whites, to the whites, because you're a coward. What he meant there, he didn't say, there's nothing wrong with the whites, they're successful. But you can stand up 
to a fellow black person. You, you, you saw that. He said, you can stand. Why? Why self-hate? Why do you do that? You would want to bring down another black person. Why don't you stand up and start encouraging each other and work together? So as a person, it's the way you look when, you are con when you are, you are, you've got conviction. And these things take time to build. And that's why success starts with you. There has to be one day, say, you know what, I can't do this anymore. This poverty, no, I have to do something about it. It has to end. I have to uplift my family. You have to think, it has to be, it has to be an emotional response. Now people think, no, I need money. Give me capital, Mr. Gandhi. Give No. When I look at you, you have no passion. You have no, you don't believe in yourself. And, you know, when we talk about conviction and believe in yourself, you don't need to tell me to give you money. It's the way you talk to me. When you come and meet me, I just say, mm. this guy, we can work together. This idea is talking about we can make money. And with him, in fact, I, by the way, billionaires, I want to say this, billionaires, you know, they use other people. They hire other people to make money. They make money with others. You don't make money alone. Here in Zambia, we tend to alone. And if Mr. Nando has money, I don't want Sui to have money. I don't want Sui to drive my car. That's very petty. Then you'll never be rich. Wealth people, they make money with others. Let's make money together. Then him has got a bigger chunk. Sometimes in certain business, it, it, even as a less chunk. You know, you find, I'll tell you, find out the one of who, Facebook. Maybe shares are 15%. The, the rest of it is owned by other shareholders. But the 15% is $200 billion. 15% of a bigger cake is $200 billion. If you look at Tesla, Elon Musk doesn't own Tesla alone. It's listed. Why? Check the shares that he owns. But because Tesla is so big, his percentage makes him the richest man in the world. Now, he owns SpaceX alone for now. Because it's true, because that's incubation. He's building it up. Because maybe people are not willing to risk it the way, the level of risk that you can take up. Okay? And that's why we say, as an inter you have to be crazy. Entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurs are crazy people. They're scary people. That's why when they drive a car, it has to be a good car. When he parks a car, people have to jump. He said, look, this person, is he a devil worshiper or what? <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Because, you know, they are not supposed to be normal. They are supposed to be extraordinary so that they can inspire others. And that's why you're not, I mean, if I look at you, uh, Sui, you're not an ordinary person. You're extraordinary. Because how many young people have a podcast? How many people have been known on TV interviewing very successful people? Because I can tell you, you are extraordinary. You are crazy. There are people who look at you, they just say, look, they fear you. Because you know what? They don't fear you because of what you have, because of your courage. How did he, okay, even talking like that, who told him to be talking like that? They can't, you know, there are people, they can't even open the mouth. Their mouth are tight, completely. You know why? Because they are so discouraged. They are in an environment which is hostile. They, are, they feed on Every day, it's poverty, negative energy, negative energy, every day. And that thing, by the way, that's why the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. It's what you hear that changes you. What you feed. Now imagine feeds you. Your mouth even tightens up. Because even the neurons, they say, don't ever open your mouth, don't. There is nothing good about you. There's nothing. 
That's, that's the environment young people, unfortunately, find them, themselves in. But for me, I'm telling young people, no. Choose no. Say, no, I'm not going to accept this. Poverty is bad. Let me go on social media. Let me see on people who inspire me. Let me see Zambians. Which Zambian can I see? Is he on Facebook? What does he do? What? And I'll tell you, for me, actually, going forward, even next year, I want to be more proactive, say, on, on Instagram, on what, on what I do, so that people know, maybe young people can start seeing some of the things we do. I post some projects. I talk about my challenges and all that kind of stuff. Because sometimes people need to know where, we, where we've been through. Because that's, that's exactly the, 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 the only way we can, we can encourage our youth. Engineer Gandu, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much for thank the time. You. I feel it's been worth the wait. Um, I think this this was ordained to be the correct day for us to have this conversation. Thank and you, I've sir. learned so much from you, really. And I know that many young people resonate with what you're saying. Um, and now I think they'll even begin to more carefully, you know, watch your success and, yeah, uh, see where it goes from here. I look forward to the 60th birthday. And uh, <laughs> no, of course, 60th birthday. Of course, look, I'm praying to God that He keeps me alive until I can reach my 60th birthday. But I, I'm telling you, uh, there has never been a better time than now. I mean, look, uh, President HH is encouraging entrepreneurs. He's an, he's an entrepreneur himself. So I'm just urging the youth to take advantage of the environment. I know the economy is biting at the moment, but I'll tell you, look, we all know that this debt issue has to be resolved. Once the debt issue is resolved, that's the time the environment to be created. But I'll tell you why. Billionaires are created in a crisis. This crisis we are in, that's a bleeding ground for billionaires. So young people actually should take advantage. Look, when you are suffering, that's the more reason you have to be innovative and creative and come out of it. So this suffering that is there now, that is the best time to say, you know what? No. Let me become an entrepreneur and make a difference. You can imagine, I mean, things are not okay, I mean, in terms of the economy, because the debt issue has not been resolved yet. But the good news is, it's being resolved. But if they, once the debt issue is resolved, it will be too late for young people, sometimes. Say it is resolved for next year. What have you been doing between now and next year? Between now and next year, prepare for that good environment. So that once you've lived through bad environment, in the good environment, you start thriving. So thank you very much. No pleasure has been ours. This has been uh, our conversation with engineer Abel Ngandu. Uh, he is an entrepreneur. He is the president of the EIZ and obviously the uh, managing director and CEO of Ngandu Consulting, gracing us with his presence. And I do know that we will see you again uh, next week. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week.